Good morning. morning. Happy Easter. Easter. May the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us as we gather on this Easter Sunday. And whoever you are, wherever you are on your journey of life and faith, you are welcome here. Just a few announcements as we begin, starting with the ending. Um, If you are a fan of the Hallelujah Chorus, we will be singing the Hallelujah Chorus after worship. You're invited to come forward. We have music sheets for you to share, and uh, we will go out with a bang with Handel's Hallelujah Chorus. So come on up and join the fun after the benediction. Or remain and take it in and listen and applaud when it's done. Um, Also about the ending. Our last hymn, this is not an April Fool's. <laughs> Our last hymn is Thine is the Glory. And if you're a careful reader of music, you will note that we sing the refrain only once at the end. So I'm going to remind you of this before we sing the last hymn, but I just want to give you a little tip. We're going to sing all the verses and then the refrain at the end. Some churches kind of goof it up and just sing the refrain after each verse, but we're going to be proper and just sing it at the end. Okay, having said that, uh, there will be a men's breakfast next Sunday morning at 8.30. If you would like to help, you can come at 8 o'clock. Now, no matter what brought you here today, you have entered the presence of God and your presence has added to this soulful chemistry that creates a space for the living God to be among us this morning. No other assembly has happened in this sanctuary in lo these many years as what has taken place because you're here right now sitting with us this morning. I invite you to be attentive to your breath, be attentive to the spirit, that is among us and abides, and join together as we continue our preparations for this, our celebration of worship.
In this world there's a whole lot of trouble, baby. In this world there's a whole lot of pain. In this world there's a whole lot of trouble, but a whole lot of ground to gain. Why take when you could be giving? Why watch as the world goes by? It's a hard enough life to be living. Why walk when you can fly? In this world there's a whole lot of sorrow, in this world there's a whole lot of shame, in this world there's a whole lot of sorrow and a whole lot of ground to gain. When you spend your whole life wishing, wanting and wondering why, it's a long enough life to be living, why walk when you can fly? In this world there's a whole lot of golden, in this world there's a whole lot of plain. In this world you've a soul for a compass and a heart for a pair of wings. There's a star on the far horizon, rising bright in an azure sky. For the rest of the time that you're given, why walk when you can fly? I Good morning. morning. May the risen Christ fill our hearts with joy, bring us new hope, and bless us with peace this Easter morning. Why walk when we can fly? Please rise in body or spirit and join me in the call to worship. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. God is alive. New birth is given. Hope is alive. A new age is dawning. Joy is alive. Redemption is here. Love is alive. Death cannot harm us. We are alive. New life is within us. The church is alive. God's spirit is within us. God of life, we worship you. God of creation, we praise you. God of revelation, we learn from you. God of resurrection, we come to celebrate you. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let us worship God.
You may be seated. Please join with me in the Easter prayer we have printed in the bulletin. Let us pray. Great and loving God, you have ransomed captive souls and raised the dead to life. Who should fear when the God who brings darkness to light is on their side? When the mountains shake and the waters thrash, the God of heaven and earth is our rescuer. When darkness threatens to swallow all light, Jesus, the Son of God, is the Son of Righteousness. When the winds of evil turn to harm the least of these, Holy Spirit, breath of the living God, triumphs over sin and death. Who should fear when the God of rescue is on their side? Amen. We're invited into a time of personal prayers of confession in silence. Amen. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. The Lord Jesus Christ is on your side, and we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. The Old Testament lesson this morning 
is from Psalm 118, verses 1 and 2, and 14 through 24. This can be found in the Blue Bible on page 534, or in your Black Bible on page 565. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live, and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Praise be to God. Now I get to invite the children and young people, whomsoever you may be, to join me up here for the children's time. and dads and sisters and brothers, it's all good. <laughs> Anybody can come up here. That's why I say children and young people whomsoever you may be, because we're all children, even us old people. We're still <laughs> children. Um, yeah, so as we get started, I'm just kind of in the mood for, sometimes you just gotta, you know. <laughs> Did you think I was going to smoke a cigarette? <laughs> April Fools. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe they still sell these things. There's old people out here that can't believe they still sell these things too. Don't smoke. All right? That was just a silly thing because it's April Fool's Day. I figured it'd be pretty silly. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever pretended to smoke in worship. <laughs> and these things don't taste very good. They tasted better when I was... Whoa! Whoa! Whoa. Whoops! <laughs> April Fools! Ha <laughs> ha! I thought you were going to get wet, right? April Fool's Day on Easter. You know what Easter is? What is it? Talk to me. It's when a person delivers candy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tyler. We got that box checked. Yes. What else is Easter? The day that um, God, Jesus forgave our sins. Yeah. And how'd that happen? Uh, he died on the cross for us. Yeah. And then what? Oh, that's it. That is it. That's God's April Fool's joke. Because everybody thought he was gone. 
And whoops, take it easy there. Okay, everybody thought he was gone. The people that wanted him away <coughs> thought that they had made him go away. And God said, mm -mm, not that easy. He's coming back. I'm going to prove something to you that I'm not leaving. And my love is the best in the world and all the universe. So that's God's April Fool's joke. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Like when you get a sword and you're mighty and powerful, right? And maybe with your sword, you shall be the king. I shall smoke you with my sword. But I have, I have a surprise for you. This is the day. That'll dry. This is the day we make bubbles. This is the day we make bubbles in church. Look at that. Wow, Mr. Orgas is not going to like that. Custodian's not going to like that. <laughs> it's just a fun thing to do because it's April Fool's Day, and even better than that, it's God's April Fool's Day because Jesus coming back from dead is God's big joke. and says, mm -mm, there's no way you're ever going to get rid of me, and there's no way that anything is going to get in the way of me showing you how much I love you. So if you haven't done an April Fool's joke, now you've got to go, go home and do an April Fool's joke. Okay? Thank you for having fun with me. And uh, you've been, um, we, 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 my hands are full of stuff. Um, let's have one more round of applause for God. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, so um, what do we do now? That's right, we pray before you go back to where you're sitting. Let's pray. Put your hands together. And you can close your eyes if you want. And if you'd like to, you can take a nice deep breath with me. And go ahead and let it out. Thank you, God, for your joy, for your life, for your light. Thank you for your spirit, the breath of our lives. Thank you that Jesus is with us all of the time. And nothing will get in the way of your love for us. Ever, 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 ever. Thank you for that. We pray all this in his name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Our reading from the New Testament this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, reading from chapter 16, the first eight verses, the traditional and original ending of Mark's Gospel. We're invited to open ourselves to God's Word and Scripture. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on, the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Amen. So I'm sure we've all had the experience of waking in the middle of the night or seeming to wake in the middle of the night from a dream and all of a sudden in the pitch dark you don't know where you are it doesn't look like your bedroom you don't even know if your dream is still going on you're questioning if it was a real dream or not and those moments in the pitch dark of not knowing it just feels like otherworldly until you come to yourself and you're not even sure when that's going to happen this is how the women felt when they went to the tomb that day. Something came upon them. Mark says that the women who visited the tomb were startled by the news that they encountered there, feeling as though the whole familiar world that they thought they knew and could count on had suddenly vanished. They were dumbfounded, dumbstruck, afraid, because everything they knew vanished in fear and uncertainty. And if you were a little bored this morning before worship and you got out the Bible and you read the annotations, you will know that Mark's gospel ends abruptly here at verse 8. So abruptly that people that came after surmised that we're kind of left in this unfinished fog, if you will. And so over the years, they've actually made attempts to clean it up a little bit. They weren't happy with it. It's sort of like Franz Schubert's Symphony No. 8 in B minor, unfinished. Nobody knows why he didn't finish it. He started it and left it for months and then passed away. But nobody really liked that. So there have been these attempts over the years to finish Schubert's famous unfinished symphony. But every time anybody hears an attempt to finish it, it kind of pales because it's not the real thing. It's not the real thing. So it's largely agreed that what we just read in Mark, those first eight verses, are actually the way he wanted his story to end. And uh, verses 9 through 16 actually are attempts by other composers to kind of buff it up, shine it up, make it, you know, come to a smooth landing. But it seems Mark gave us these verses on purpose, the ones that end with they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, and as if you don't get the point, for they were afraid. They run away. There was once a time when a theology student memorized the whole Gospel of Mark. He wanted to perform a Broadway-style dramatic reading of the Gospel of Mark, so he memorized it, and then performed it. He recited the whole thing. And after the first performance, when he gets to this abrupt ending, he stands there on stage, awkwardly, shifting from one foot to the other. And the audience is there waiting and waiting for more, waiting for some sort of closure, some sort of proper ending. And so after several anxious seconds, he said, Amen, and made his exit. And everybody was relieved, and the audience applauded. They were very appreciative. But later, he was considering his performance, and he thought, you know what? I provided too satisfying a conclusion with that amen. I think I betrayed what Mark really was trying to accomplish, his intention in the text. So the next night, when he gave his performance of the Gospel of Mark, he reached the final verse. All he did was pause for half a beat, and he left the stage in silence. And the discomfort and the uncertainty in the audience was palpable. And everybody exited with a buzz of conversation, dominated by this experience of the non-ending. But the reality is, this non-ending is not really the last word. Because what I like to call the Jesus event actually kept going. It says, they fled and said nothing to anyone. But apparently, somebody talked. Because we're here. Hello. You see, Mark 
had a hope. His hope was that somebody might finish the story. That's what he hoped. Mark wanted somebody to finish the story that he left unfinished. Mark got it. The very first verse in the Gospel of Mark says, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. And so, this ending is the ending of that beginning. The rest of the story was yet to be told. Mark was writing for people who, whose lives were at risk. Their very lives were at risk. It wasn't at all clear how the whole Christian story was going to end. They were in the midst of war and rumors of war. Early Christians could not know how their life or death would play out, did not know how their fidelity or their betrayals would play out. They did not know the future or the dissolution of what was this emerging idea of a church community. They had no idea. So it turns out, this is all about the power of God. I'm talking about light. I'm talking about life. I'm talking about love. This is the power of God. It cannot be domesticated, cannot be buried, cannot be fled, cannot be contained. That's what happened. That's what happened then. That's what happens now. That's why the ending of Mark is not an ending at all. It's the beginning of the good news. Other languages besides English have something known as the imperfect tense. We know present tense in English. We get present tense. Other languages have something called aorist, where it's past tense. English, for those of you who are English majors, lacks the imperfect tense. The imperfect tense describes action that has begun and is continuing. Begun and is continuing. Everything in this story, my friends, is written in the Greek in the imperfect tense. It's an imperfect Easter. Leaving room for you and you and you and me. Leaving room for how the good news of the Easter story will be lived. Remember their worries? Oh, who will roll the stone away? It's so big. And it's already rolled away. Another lesson in Greek. You ready? <laughs> the word for door in Greek is thura. It has three meanings. Door, an opening in a cave or tomb, and, drum roll, a favorable time for accessing an opportunity. Let me repeat that. A favorable time for accessing an opportunity. There was no stone, there was no door, there was a portal, there was a gateway, and it never closed. It's still open. All three of those meanings are still operative today, all three of them. We have today an invitation to respond, to be a part of that favorable time accessing a possibility. Today's the day. We don't have any more control over it than those th women did that day. They didn't want to deal with it. But that doesn't take away from the fact that opening doors and providing abundant life is the business that God is in. That's it. And there is grace. Why? Because I can relate a lot easier to these women who went to the tomb afraid and uncertain and in terror and dumbstruck then if you told me a story about people that went to the tomb and they had their clipboards and they were taking notes, right, and they had all the, everything ready for the next uh, potluck supper on Wednesday, 12 feet away from the tomb, they're ready to teach the next Bible study. You know, I, I, I can't relate to that. But I can relate to these women real well, more often than not, right? More often than not. Because of the things that happen in this world, in this life, in my life, in your life, that leave me uncertain and afraid and seized by terror and dumbstruck. There's grace in there because the door is open. Open the door. 
The unfinished story is hanging in the air. It's right there. Death no longer contains him. Life and light and love. Life and light and love has the final word. That's the final word. Can't be domesticated, can't be buried, can't be fled, can't be contained. He's before us. He's out there if we seek him. That's what's already happened. Look, maybe you didn't read the New Testament this morning, right? You got up and had breakfast. You ran out of time. You had to come to church. So I'm going I'm to give you a quick synopsis, okay? You ready? Here's what happens. Jesus appears. He gets baptized. God interrupts, says a few things. This is my son. Listen to him. God retreats and waits for Jesus to act. Okay? Next, Jesus is transfigured. Remember that one? Up on the mountain. God breaks in, says a few things to the disciples. This is my son. Listen to him. God retreats, waiting to see what they will do. Okay? Next, Jesus is resurrected. God steps in, says a few things to a few women who at the moment are too frightened to really know what to do. God probably knows that. Jesus is already off searching for human representation in Galilee. God is waiting for people who are willing to finish the story. That's you and me. That's you and me. So maybe you're not sure what's next, right? For every one of us in here, there's a thousand stories. Where's your marriage going? What are you going to do about that job? When are you going to call the doctor? How much time does she have? Fill in the blanks, right? The door is open. The door is open. It's about light. It's about life. It's about love. That's it. All you got to do is take a step. He's right there with you in all those thousand stories that you brought with you this morning, especially the ones you're not sure of. Take the step and follow him. He's already out there waiting for you. Thanks be to God. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. Gracious God, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter, you clear your throat and the mountains melt. We thank you that you have not left us alone, that we are like you in so many ways, in the ways that you give and the love that you provide. Continue with us, Lord, even in our doubts, even in our worries, even in our uncertainties. Transpose them into vessels of your light and your life and your love. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.
please remain standing and join me in reading the affirmation of faith, which is printed in your bulletin. Your light, light is the, the only light we need, need as we travel through life's mystery. Your word, the only voice we hear, that still small voice that leads us to the place where we should be. Your presence is the only company we need as we walk this narrow road. Your fellowship, the warmth we crave to help us on our way. May the truth of Easter, the joy of Easter, and the blessings of Easter be with us this day and all days. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. On this glorious morning, we welcome you into our lives. We welcome your new life, for it is life-changing, life-giving, and life-sustaining. We welcome, Lord, the hope that it brings to our world, the joy that it brings to our darkness. We welcome the empty tomb because we know that it means that you are on the loose. And we thank you for your fierce whimsy that never took no for an answer. And so we pray that your new life by your spirit would give life to those today who feel lifeless, who are just going through the motions, those who are grieving. We pray your life-giving spirit would be upon them here and everywhere and we name them in our hearts. We pray your new life would give hope to those who are mired in despair, who feel hopeless, and those who are about ready to let go and give up all hope. Be among them, Lord, your children. Those that struggle and suffer where there is warfare and violence, by the hands and the mistakes of those so far away whose only care is for themselves. We pray for them. May your new life give joy for those who have none. And may you be loose in this world evermore through our hearts, our hands, our feet, our mouths, our eyes, and our spirits. We give you our thanksgivings. Prepare us, Lord, to be your people in this world in such need. We ask it in the strong name of our living friend and savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who asked us when we pray to remember this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory and the glory forever. Amen. With grateful hearts, let us now present our offerings to the Lord.
let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the empty tomb and for Jesus' victory over the grave. Just as Jesus' death pardoned our sin, his resurrection assures our future. On this Easter morning, accept these gifts as a token of our gratitude and as an affirmation of our commitment to be your faithful disciples. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, amen. amen. Okay, kids, you got the memo, right? Last hymn, <laughs> only sing the refrain at the end. All right, got it? Let's go. Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. 